and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership series. My name is Scott Miller, and I serve each week as your interviewer and host. Our discussion today is with the famed organizational psychologist and New York Times bestselling author, Tasha Urich, whose recent book, Insight, The Surprising Truth About How Others See Us, How We See Ourselves, and why the answers matter more than you think. Tasha, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you, Scott. It's so great to be here. So Tasha, I have to tell our listeners and viewers, you were actually scheduled to be interviewed about three weeks ago. Your, your book came across my social feed, not typically how I pick one of the 52 interviews for what is now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, but the topic is something I've been passionate about for 25 years. And uh, I always try to read the book cover to cover. And the fact of the matter is, between you and I that I'll now share, I actually postponed your interview and called you because I was so engrossed in your book, I wanted to kind of do it justice and read it all. So thank you for your patience and gracious to, graciousness to come back on today's interview. I really cannot wait to see how poorly self-aware I am, <laughs> which I'm sure is the case. <laughs> you're, you're in the same boat as all of us, so you're not alone, don't worry. I think that's right. And I have to give ode and tribute to this gorgeous background you've got. We've got rivaling bookcases, and I see just to your left a copy of Dr. Covey's iconic Eighth Habit book, kind of straddling the blue and purple space there. Was it difficult for you to make a decision where to put the Eighth Habit? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I went with the blue, but when you and I started talking about it, I feel like it should have gone in the white. So we'll, we'll see where it ends up. This How's my first pandemic project in quarantine. <laughs> well, it's looking great. How indicative is your backdrop as an insight into your personality? Um, well, if you looked in my closet, you would see something similar. You would see by type and by color of garment. So this is not unusual for me. It just makes me feel like the world is a little bit less chaotic that way. My wife, Stephanie Miller, would adore you. Let's talk a bit about uh, uh, your experience and kind of what's brought you to writing this really seminal book, Insight. Talk a bit about your background and what led you to write your first book and then, of course, the second book. I think it's second book, Insight. Correct. So I am an organizational psychologist. I have been doing this for um, a little bit more than 15 years now. And the way I came into the field um, is actually, it means a lot to me in my heart, not just in my sort of intellectual pursuits. But I'm a third generation entrepreneur. When I was growing up with a single mom, um, she didn't want to have a traditional office job because she wanted to be able to spend as much time with me as possible. And she was also looking at what was happening with other families. This was, you know, about the mid 1980s, where a lot of parents who were both working, a lot of single parents didn't have childcare. And so what she ended up doing was starting the first uh, organization in the nation, in the United States, that trained and certified nannies and placed them in the homes of, of the folks who needed them. And so I got to almost every day, you know, when I wasn't at school, follow her to work and watch her be the CEO and lead a company. And so I got to see how um, people transform business, but businesses also transform people. She was able to you know, lead our family, to create prosperity, to create you know, livelihoods for all the people that worked for her. And so from then on, I was hooked. I didn't know it, so it kind of went into my subconsciousness. Um, so flash forward, I went to uh, university, I studied psychology, I knew that I didn't want to be one of those clinical psychologists, you know, I, I want to sort of help people move forward, and I don't think I want to work with those types of populations. Um, so I was looking for somewhere to apply my passion for people. And um, lo and behold, I actually, in my, um, you know, 20-year-old naivete, I thought I had invented this field. But I was like, if somebody could take business and psychology and put them together, that's what I want to do. And lo and behold, I did a little bit of Googling and re realized that this field had been around since, you know, before World War II. And uh, I was in great company. There were so many, so many exciting things happening in the field. So I remember I moved the tiny liberal arts school that I went to for college actually didn't have a course in organizational psychology. So I moved to New York in the summer of 2001. And the first class that I, the first moment of the first class that I took, 
I knew that this was what I was put on this earth to do. And so from there on, it was actually, um, it wasn't simple, but it was easy in terms of the decisions I made. I ultimately decided I wanted to go into a PhD program. I was lucky enough to go to one, I was one of the top ones in the country in industrial organizational psychology. But I also knew that I wanted to spend my career applying these concepts. I, I've always loved research that is, is a theme that flows through most of what I do, but I wanted to be in there rolling at my sleeves, helping CEOs, helping C-suite teams really grow their business and create prosperity. And so I got to do a lot of consulting when I was in graduate school. I spent about five years in the Fortune 500 world uh, leading a uh, leadership development program at an engineering company. Then I went to healthcare um, and kind of built a leadership development program from the ground up. And then I went out on my own. Um, and this was about eight or so years ago now. And my first book, Bankable Leadership, was um, my stab at creating a framework to think about leadership. So, you know, there's no shortage of leadership books out there, but what I wanted to do is kind of put everything together in this most meta framework of how leaders um, approach the challenges that they face. And what I realized was most leaders on a daily basis feel a tension between making people happy and driving results for their businesses. And so that was what Bankable Leadership was about, was to help people resolve that tension, learn how to do both. Um, and from there, my interest in self-awareness kind of came from that, where you know I, I work with people who like to win big and I help them win more. <laughs> you know, These are mostly CEOs and C-suite executives of mid to large size companies. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more about my work on self-awareness, but that is where I just feel grateful every day to be able to wake up and help people um, be as successful as possible, make a big of a, as big of a mark as possible, and just live good lives. Tasha, thank you for that. You aren't the first author to write about self-awareness, but I'm here to declare you're the best because your book is a oh, masterpiece. It's so great that upon reading it the first time, I texted our president and he downloaded it and listened to it on audio that night. It's a, it's a topic that Paul Walker and I are super passionate about for you know, 25 years now. In fact, Dr. Covey wrote about self-awareness in his seminal book, mm -hmm. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, 30 years ago. In fact, one of the four human gifts that complemented imagination and conscience, free will, was self-awareness. So 30 years ago, Dr. Covey was evangelizing the message. Here you are now writing about it with much more detail, insight, research, and applicability. To the extent you agree, why do you think not a lot of progress has been made amongst the Scott Millers of the world in terms of our own self-awareness? What's going on that's made this as important now as it was perhaps 30, 50, 100 years ago? Sure. What's so interesting, just to kind of um, riff on that a little bit, Self-awareness is almost as old as humanity itself. You know, you look at the ancient Greeks, they carved know thyself right. on the temple of Apollo at Delphi, right? So this is old, old stuff that we should be self-aware. But what I noticed was um, a lot of people write about it, a lot of people think about it, where I wanted to contribute in this field and this kind of lifelong struggle to become more self-aware is the surprising science behind it. You know, you, you sort of think about how many articles we've all read in the last three months on, you know, be more self-aware, get more feedback, yeah. uh, ask yourself the right questions. But what I always suspected was there was probably more to it than we thought scientifically. And I just knew sort of deep in my bones that there would be surprises. And so when you take a step back from all of the fascinating findings we, we uncovered in this kind of first of its kind research program, it makes sense that so many of us have so much work to do. It's because, you know, A, some people don't prioritize it. B, some people know it's important, but they, um, you know, don't sort of make the time. Or C, which I think is really common in our field, is people work on it very um, uh, wholeheartedly. But there are so many myths and misconceptions and traps that we can fall into that can suck the insight right out of the experience. Um, and so that was what I wanted my contribution to be. And I think it explains why so many of us have so much work to do, including me, by the way. Well, you have earned the PhD, not me. But in 30 years, I've hired hundreds of people, and I've had to terminate dozens of people. And I, as I talk from the stage a lot as an author myself, there hasn't been a person in my 30 years as a leader that I have terminated because they lacked the technical skills to do the job. Almost to a T, their exit came pretty much in correlation to their lack of self-awareness 
what it was like to work with them, what it was like to meet with them, what it was like to collaborate with them or report to them. I mean, it's a, it's a major systemic issue. And I, I've heard you say and write that sort of the higher up in an organization you are, the less likely you are to be self-aware because of all the natural politics and sycophants and such. Will you talk a bit about and define what does it mean to be self-aware? And for that matter, what does it mean to be sort of self-deluding, self-delusional? That's a great place to start because I think the term self-awareness is one many people throw around and we all mean different things. So our research team has been studying self-awareness for going on six years now. And it actually took us almost a year at the beginning to define what this actually was. Um, and so that seems like a good place to start. So we read, you know, hundreds of research articles. We surveyed people all around the world. We you know, found people who didn't start out as self-aware, who became self-aware, we'll come back to them. But here's the definition we arrived at. Self-awareness at a high level is the will and skill to see yourself clearly, right? That kind of makes sense. But if you go down one more level of detail, this is where it starts to get interesting. Self-awareness is essentially made up of two types of self-knowledge. So the first is something we call internal self-awareness, which is knowing who we are from the inside out, knowing what we value, what we're passionate about, you know, what our behavioral patterns are, and so on. And equally important is something called external self-awareness, which means knowing how other people see us. So that's self-awareness from the outside in. And what we discovered were that these two types of self-knowledge were actually completely independent. So the journey of self-awareness is really about focusing on both. We found that some people are higher in one than the other, um, but both are equally important. And I know we'll kind of uncover that a little bit more today. Talk a bit about self-delusion and how easy it is for us to fall in that trap. Speak to the, the people leaders that are listening and watching today. I think everybody thinks we're, I think most people think they're more self-aware than they are, starting with me. And I think it's an accurate insight personally accurate that the higher up you are in an organization, the less self-aware you are because you get less feedback. You have more hubris and more confidence. And the quickest way to create a career cul-de-sac is to give your boss some feedback on herself or himself. Talk a bit about how easy it is to fall into this self-delusional um, aspect. Let me give you a couple of data points that I think really say a lot. So we've discovered in our research that about 95% of people believe themselves to be self-aware, but only about 10 to 15% of us really are. And the joke I always make about this is you put those two numbers together and what it shows is that on a good day, 80% of us are lying to ourselves about whether we're lying to ourselves. Hmm. And that's where it starts to get a little bit scary, right? I think the question that we should all be asking, you know, not on a, on a daily basis, but often is, if I weren't as self-aware as I might think I am, how would I know? And paradoxically, what we've discovered in people who made these dramatic improvements in their self-awareness, you know, who maybe sometimes did go from self-delusion to clarity, um, they had that orientation of sort of no matter what I think I know about myself, there's always more to discover. Tasha, a rudimentary question. How, how, how does someone know if they're sufficiently self-aware? Are there three or four questions we should ask ourselves? Kind of walk us through the process to self-diagnose if we're in need of improvement on our own self-awareness. That's a really good question. And we've actually found differences in asking people generally versus specifically. So the 95% figure is if you ask people, hey, do you think you're self-aware? Almost everybody says yes, but there are specific pillars of self-awareness. In other words, things we know about ourselves when we are self-aware that begin to uncover our knowledge or our lack thereof. So I'll give you just a couple of examples. Again, we found seven, but number one, how clear are your values? You know, do you have clearly articulated principles that you live your life by? Do you know what your passions are? What are those things that make you want to leap out of bed in the morning? Do you have clarity on those? Do you design your life to fit those passions? Um, another one, just as an example, is, is our reaction. So not just our in the moment thoughts and feelings and behaviors and being in control and aware of them, but um, do we know those strengths and weaknesses that, the, that our behavior um, almost always sort of exhibits in terms of the themes that we see? So what we found is when you start to ask people more specific questions, um, they start to see where they might need to do more work. 
I think the concept in your book, you call it alarm clock moments. Can you riff a bit on how important it is to understand, to look for, be aware of alarm clock moments and how those can increase our self-awareness? Sure. Well, 2020, I think, is a collective alarm clock moment, um, no matter what you're experiencing in the world. Alarm clock moments are um, situations or events that create huge opportunities for unexpected insight. So an alarm, alarm clock moment is basically any situation that you find yourself in um, where you can, if you dig into it and you approach it the right way, you can emerge on the other side with uh, increased insight about who you are, what you want, how you fit into the world. But what's interesting is just because an alarm clock moment happens, our research has shown that not everyone benefits from it. And that's where it's so important to look at the people who are self-aware and what are they doing differently. Um, these people are not you know, spending endless amounts of time in therapy or you know, filling up entire journals every week. They're really just asking themselves some strategic, smart questions. For example, when an alarm clock moment happens, um, you know, during the pandemic, what kind of person do I wanna be? What kind of person do I want to be after this is over? Those are some examples of how we can really harness these alarm clock moments to get that insight. Tasha, I think it was in the opening couple of chapters of the book, you disguised the person, but there was a gentleman that was <laughs> uh, kind of going through a life-changing professional situation. I think a lot of people can find, if they're self-aware, can find themselves in him. I certainly did. I, in fact, it might have been written about me. I don't think we met before, so fortunately it's not. But it was pretty you're, close. You're good. Don't worry. <laughs> Will you recreate that story for people in some detail, and then what's next? What can people learn from that? Sure. So I call this the cautionary and inspiring tale of Steve. And to your point, you're correct, this is not his actual name. Um, I, again, so many people that I work with have such incredible journeys. This is just one example. But when I first met Steve, he was, um, he had just received a promotion a couple years, or a couple months rather, before that. And unbeknownst to him, he was crashing and burning. Um, his CEO essentially brought me in and said, here's the situation, uh, if you can't turn this person around, I don't think he's long for this role. You know, he was really on the verge of being fired. So I decided to uh, get to know Steve and ask him some questions and figure out, you know, what is the situation looking like from his perspective? And it was interesting. The first meeting we had, you know, we sort of were sitting in his office with this long wooden conference table and he was pacing back and forth. And, um, you know, I felt for him because his business really was in need of, of a radical transformation. He, he was not handed a perfectly functioning, successful function. And so I was asking him how it was going and he was saying things like, you know, I'm trying really hard. I know I'm a, I'm a tough leader, but I'm a fair leader, but none of my employees seem to want to follow me. And actually several of them have quit. And I just don't know if they're just probably not committed to this. I don't know what's going on. And I said, okay, well, um, let's find out what's happening. Are you game for that? And, you know, a lot of times when I'm coaching, you know, in this case, Steve, he says, oh yeah, 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 sure. Go talk to some people. But then I did what I always do with my consulting coaching clients, which is talk to, I think it was in his case, about 25 people that he worked with. So whenever I'm coaching a leader, I talk to their direct reports, you know, their, their supervisor, their board members, if they're the CEO. I even talk to their friends, family, and older children. And the picture that emerged of Steve was very different than the one he had of himself. You know, I, I won't go into too much detail, but basically people saw him as a jerk and a bully. And so I had to be the one to tell him this. And actually, that's what I'm often hired to do. So many of us in this field, you know, part of the value we bring is to tell very successful, powerful people the truth when everyone else is afraid to. So I show back up at his office and I've got this report. And, you know, I said, Steve, there's no other way to say this to you, but your team hates you. And he was floored. He was absolutely floored. So I told him, you know, they perceive that you yell at them, you know, you slam your fist on the table, you don't coach them, you sort of uh, manage by exception and bring people into your office and, and you make them cry a lot when they, when they leave. And he said, basically, after having an eruption, characteristic of him, he said, you mean I've been doing all these things for, what, 20 years and nobody told me. And I think that's just such a profound statement for every leader. You know, you mentioned some of the data that, that we found that 
the higher up we get in an organization, the less self-aware we tend to be. It's not always because we start out less so. It's that when we're in senior powerful positions, fewer and fewer people tell us the truth. Um, and I was lucky enough to work with Steve over the course of, oh gosh, many months, um, but he was able to turn around his leadership by being willing to look himself in the mirror and see who he was, figure out what he stood for, and then probably more importantly in his case, understand the impact he was having on the people around him. Um, he went from people quitting in droves to becoming someone that people were really loyal to. And it was all because he was willing to uh, take that on. He had the courage, he had the commitment. Obviously he had me. My job was to help him improve and we did that. Tasha, it's a great story. I mean, I can relate to it. I have had employees come to me, fortunately not previously, but in my less mature years and say, we hate you because I was Steve, pretty much lock, stock and barrel. You said something I, I find interesting and that is that Steve said, no one had ever told me when you coach leaders and executives, how often is it the case that no one ever told them versus they never listened? Mm, oh gosh, I think it's a little bit of both in many cases. Um, sometimes I hear at first, well, I've never heard that. And then as I peel back the onion, they'll admit, yeah, you know, I, the first time I heard that was actually 10 years ago and I did this 360. And so it's almost like the defense mechanism prevents right. it from getting right. in, um, even if they have heard it. And what I've found is you, you typically, again, especially with really successful people, you've got to overwhelm those defense mechanisms with data. That's something that business, you know, great business people listen to data. Um, and that's the way I work and the way that I think Steve really was able to change his perspective. In the book, you share a lot of great uh, self-aware stories about your experience going to a mindfulness retreat with your sister. You also share a great story that I just loved about when you finished your PhD, you had a chance to go out with your husband and some friends at a local bar or restaurant and something interesting happened that you kind of unpacked and became more self-aware. I think this is something a lot of us can relate to. Can you recreate that story and then share with us what we can take from it? Sure, if I must. Um, this, is, this is in the category of everyone, including and especially self-awareness researchers have room to improve. So the, the medium-sized version of the story, um, this was actually just a couple of years ago, I was in the middle of working on Insight and you know, I thought, who better to write a book on self-awareness than me, someone who is so highly self-aware? <laughs> and literally, I'm I'm working on the book, and and I was you know having a couple of days where I just you know didn't get out of my pajamas, and I was working way too much. And my husband said, we need to get you out of the house. So he called up six of our closest friends that we had known, you know, I had known for more than ten years at that time, and we all went out to dinner. And it was just this wonderful break. <laughs> I was able to relax a little bit. Um, and I was the designated driver that evening. And so we, we went to dinner. We went to a, a kind of a dive bar in downtown Denver afterwards. And um, my friend Teresa, who, had, who was not the designated driver, um, she had had a couple glasses of wine at dinner. And she sort of slides up to me. And she was, you know, kind of looking at me and smiling. And I said, Teresa, what's going on? She said, well, Tasha, I just wanted to tell you, I am so happy that Dave, my husband, brought you into our lives all of those years ago. And I just felt so warm and fuzzy and in love with my friends. But then she continued. She said, <laughs> and I quote, mm, and boy, have you come a long way since we first met you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember sitting there going, I have absolutely no idea what she's talking about, none. And so I knew I had sort of two doors I could go down. Door A was uh, change the subject and pray right. she wouldn't remember tomorrow. Right. And B, which is what I would force my clients to do, was ask her, why Teresa? Tell me Whatever more. do you mean? Yes. <laughs> and so I did. Um, and she went into excruciating detail. Um, right. uh, the very, very short version was um, apparently when my friends and my husband first met me, they saw me as incredibly high maintenance. So I thought, oh my goodness. Well, clearly she's wrong. And I, luckily I had my husband trapped in the car on the way home, right? So I'm at the driver's seat, he's in the passenger seat. He can't move, he can't escape. And so I decided I was gonna use this opportunity to prove how wrong my friend Teresa had been. Plus he had so some liquid him, courage, right? Cause you were the designated driver. She did, she did. And that, 
<laughs> There's an insight there, actually. Yeah. Maybe we'll come back to that when we talk about uh, takeaways for, <laughs> that we can all use. Um, but I told him what she had said, dead silence on the other side of the car, just dead silence. And so I, I thought like, okay, he obviously agrees with her. And I asked him if he could give a couple of examples after he said, is this a trick question? I'm like, no, 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 I want to know. And so just like Teresa had, he had several examples that sprung to mind almost immediately. And he was able to give with, with no preparation at all. Um, and so I just remember I, I was floored for literally weeks about this, that the people that I loved the most, who knew me the best, had been sitting on this gold, you know, again, as tough as it was to hear, for 10 years. And nobody had told me. And when I'm talking to audiences, you know, speaking all around the world, I ask that question is, the people that know you the best, what do they know that could be helpful to you that they haven't told you? And so I'm just going to give everyone a, a tool. Um, and this is a tool that I um, sort of developed as I was going through this experience. Um, and as I, I talked to a, a communications professor named Josh Meisner, who developed it, um, it's called the Dinner of Truth. And essentially what you do is you don't rely on the people that know you the best to volunteer this information. Um, we now know from, from decades of research that it's very unlikely they will, um, unless you know they're feeling very brave or very drunk in Teresa's case. Right. <laughs> and basically what you do is you invite someone who you care about out for a drink, a meal, and you ask them, ready for this? What is the one thing I do that is most annoying to you? And then you listen and you learn. And you know, there's a lot we could talk about with this tool, but what I've discovered after doing it so, so many times is what we learn are things that are almost always under our control. And therefore, once we know them, we have power to change them. And it strengthens our relationships, it makes us more effective, it puts us in charge of our own destiny. Um, so all of that came about from that drunken conversation in the bar with my friend, Teresa. Well, I think it's extraordinarily valuable. You, you captivated me with this, this concept that people are sitting on gold, you mentioned about you. Yeah. And that's so true. If you can just facilitate the conversation without disputing it, defending it, denying it, the people who really care about you during this dinner of truth, you call it, I think could be transformative. Uh, take that a step further. Flip into parenting for a moment. Mm -hmm. What can those of us who are parents or caretakers or guardians or aunts or uncles, how can we help to develop more self-aware children? Are there some, some tactics or techniques that you uncovered in your research that allows us to be better, not just role models, but actually help our children to become more self-aware? That's a really important question, I think, especially now. What I often tell um, you know, audiences that I speak to about self-awareness is, you know, in some sense, forget all the benefits it gives you at work. Think about what this could do for you at home. You know, you have, people who are self-aware have stronger marriages, they have more fulfilling relationships, and they raise less narcissistic, uh, more self-aware children. So it's, it's a worthy goal and an important one. There's a lot of research on this, but I think one study that sticks out in particular looked at how parents actually speak to their children. And they, they classified uh, the, the ways of speaking to kids in sort of one of two ways. Number one was um, almost like an exceptionalism view of you are the best, you are the smartest, you are the, you know, insert some kind of superlative, versus talking to them with warmth. I love you, you are important to me. Um, you, you know, you'll always be my kid no matter what happens. What the researchers found over time was that the parents who had that more kind of exceptionalist way of speaking to their kids, those kids tended on average to show more narcissism versus the kids that were raised with uh, more warmth-based conversations tended to be um, more humble and more self-aware. And what I love about that study is it's, you know, it's, it's a trap that I think so many of us can fall into, but it's a very easy change to just keep that in our minds and remember focus on that love, focus on the warmth, um, and that's really what will get you far more mature and functional children. Okay, so the doctor is in the house. I want you to give me some insight. And I don't know this is unique to me, right? So 
Uh, as an officer in a company, I have a fairly public profile. I'm an author. I have a social media platform. And you've written about, and I've heard you on a podcast, talk about this conundrum of what we post on social media. It can be very narcissistic. It's a lot about us. What advice would you give all of us who are concerned about our brand, who are growing our influence, who are trying to build our careers, we're trying not to be self-delusional or narcissistic. At the same time, we want to be self-aware and add value to other people. And undeniably, social media is the new medium with which we share our thoughts and our expertise and through which we are abundant and help to you know, build other people's insights. What's the right balance, doctor? <laughs> well, the doctor is in. The doctor has advice, as always. Um, there's one way to think about this that I think can be really valuable, and, and that is what is my goal for posting this thing on social media or for reaching my audience or creating a new product or service? I think as much as we can make it about contribution and about making other people um, happier, better, more successful, right, in service of others, then we are much less likely to fall into those traps of you know, social media being a me megaphone, which there's a lot of research, not surprisingly, that shows that. And so what we discovered, um, we, we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet, but these highly self-aware people from our study that didn't start out that way, we actually found that they used social media more than the average person. And, and I thought for a minute, like, what is that about, right? These very self-aware people, social media is not a platform for humility typically, but what we started to look at is how were they using social media? And there were incredible differences. So instead of, for example, you know, it's my child's half birthday today, or this is the amazing vacation I went on. They say, I use social media, you know, I, I post a beautiful photo because it will make people's day better or an article that might be helpful um, or you know something funny that I saw. I, I tell people jokes because I want to make them laugh. If you use social media in service of others, um, I think a lot of those dangers or pitfalls start to fade away. So the question I would challenge you know all of the folks listening to this right now is: the next time you go to post something on social media, ask yourself what is my goal. Yeah. And a lot of times, if you're like me, when I first started dealing with all of this was a lot of times I really was saying, oh, I just want to tell people how awesome I am. If that's the answer, don't post it. Challenge yourself to figure out how can I be in service of others. <laughs> I, uh, that's very insightful, no pun. I am very reflective right now about how I use my social media as a me megaphone, to quote you, or as um, a chance to get validated because my parents didn't 50 years ago for some reason. Right, it's, all of us, we're all in yeah, that position. <laughs> it's all our parents' fault. Um, except for my kids, of course, who won't blame me at all. Uh, no, that's not your fault at all. No, 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 the doctor said so. Tasha, our time is ending, but I wanna, I wanna miss probably quote a part of your book. I think you mentioned in here something like 30-ish million people are reported to actually use their phones I think you said in the restroom or in the bathroom, which is like, you know, 10% of the American population. And with the impact that screen time and access to our phones is impacting our own ability to focus and be self-aware. Can you talk to that point that I just slaughtered and give us some parting tips on how we can build our self-awareness, our insight, lower our delusion, by putting some ground rules, rules and separating ourselves from our addictions to screen time? Mm -hmm. well, I think uh, particularly now during this global pandemic, I don't know about you, but I have my screen time has probably tripled no on an average day. Yes. Um, and there's a, 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 everything, the answer is a study, right? Because that's who I am. Um, but there was a study that was done that asked people to spend five minutes alone in a room without their phone or they could give themselves mild electric shocks. And guess what most people chose? <laughs> they said, I can't possibly sit here without my phone for five minutes. Who does that? Um, I am going to at least do something, even if that something is painful. Um, and, and to me, that says it all. We, even now, when I'm reaching for my phone, it's because I want to escape from what's happening right now. I want that hit of dopamine. You know, if I find an article about a vaccine or you know, whatever I'm looking for, I don't even know how. Or time. someone tagged me or someone mentioned Or me. someone tagged me yes, and right. I get the validation, right? right. I, what's right. my Instagram post? How many people have liked yes. it? 
And I think as much, this is easy for me to say, my husband locked my BlackBerry in the hotel safe on our honeymoon. So please note <laughs> that. Um, but we just, we have to focus on this mindfulness as much as we possibly can. It doesn't mean we should put our phones away forever. But I think if there's even an opportunity, you know, for a couple of hours a day to put your phone away, spend time with your kids, go on a walk, do something for you. Um, there's a, a positive correlation between people who practice mindfulness and self-awareness. And especially now, you know, we want to escape being alone with our own thoughts, but this could be that very alarm clock moment that we talked about earlier, where there's so much we can learn. You know, it does, we don't have to go overboard, but let's, let's let ourselves into ourselves just a little bit. Dr. Tasha Urich, I loved your book. I loved this conversation even more. Your book is Insight, The Surprising Truth About How Others See Us, How We See Ourselves, and Why the Answers Matter More Than We Think. I like this concept of these golden nuggets, so to speak, that others have about us. Remind me the name of the dinner I should schedule. The Dinner of Truth. The dinner. Not <laughs> ominous at all, right? No, not at all. <laughs> well, I can tell you Stephanie Miller, my spouse, will be signing up for the first Dinner of Truth, and there'll be a yeah, long excellent. line of people that can't wait for an invitation as long as I'm paying. Thank you for your time today. I so appreciate you coming on. Looking forward to having you back someday. Tell us what's next for you. What's in the pipeline for you? Well, before the pandemic started, I began work on a book called, I am not kidding you, when bad things happen. <laughs> so it's uh, taken on a whole new meaning, but basically what I'm, what I'm starting a research project on now are, is how do we bounce back from the wrongs, harms, and hurts that we feel so often um, at work and in life. Um, and so I'm really excited about that very early in the process, but um, still Insight is my, my second baby. I love it, I will cherish it forever, and now it's time to add one to the family. Dr. Yurek, thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. And thank you for joining us. If you're not subscribing to Franklin Covey's weekly on leadership series, this interview comes out in both video and audio format every Tuesday via email. You can visit franklincovey.com, click on the on leadership button, subscribe, sign up your friends, your family, your colleagues, anybody around the world who might benefit from this weekly conversation around topics related to increasing your leadership skills. If you're consuming it via podcast, we're on every major podcast channel. Rate it, review us. We'd love to have you give us any feedback, and we'll see you back here next week for a new guest on leadership.